Ian, I've been thoroughly enjoying reading the hard copy. You know, it was delightful to see you get them uh, delivered that, that day. Oh, All right, the, yes. Tremendous uh, sense of achievement and uh, and quite rightly too. It's an amazing doc, uh, document, two volumes. And, I, and thank you yeah. so much for letting me read it prior to publication as well. Um, oh, great pleasure. It's a very rich, rich book in so many ways. But we just to focus down on um, for people who a, a lot of people who are seeing this will will have heard your talk about you know the two difference the differences between the brain. And the main thing for me is that you've emphasised that um, the two hemispheres really. Um, pay attention to the world in different ways. And I think that's absolutely important. I first heard of the um, idea that the brain had two hemispheres, you know, a long time ago, it, it, Richard pointed it out to us and, and said it was something worthy of uh, paying attention to. And I think you produced a, a volume that pays enormous attention to it and how um, people, um, you know, if, through strokes and brain damage and so on, you can confirm these differences over and over again. And you've done that brilliantly. But, um, well, I, yeah, I mean, I'm, it's not just me saying that. But I want the left hemisphere is really critical to the way the world's going at the moment, it seems, isn't it? And I, I just want to say something, read something from... Um, the Sufis, which was written in 1964, published in 1964, and it, it, it chimes beautifully, I think, with what you're saying. The conquest of the commanding self, which is an object of the Sufi struggle, is not achieved merely by acquiring control over one's passions. It is looked upon as a taming of the wild consciousness, which believes that it can take what it needs from everything, including mysticism, and bend it to its own use. The tendency to employ material from whatever source for personal benefit is understandable in the partially complete world of ordinary life, but cannot be carried over into the greater world of real fulfillment. And later on in that book, um, he, Shah goes on to say that the amor proper the love of self, the, the commanding self, must first be seen in its real light before any refining of a human being um, can actually be done. And I, that to me means it, it, you have put um, more solid thinking into what was called in the past the commanding self. It's the left hemisphere. And the left yes. hemisphere. And and I'd like you to talk yeah. a bit about that and also why you think that it's causing our culture to commit suicide. Yes. <laughs> um, no quite. Well, I mean, the interesting thing for me is that I don't, I didn't approach this principally from a background of knowledge about religious traditions, spiritual traditions, the mythologies of other parts of the world. They came to be important to me in the process of writing this and just of living a life. So I didn't begin with any preconceptions about the commanding self. And when I called the earlier book, the master and his emissary, uh, I thought I'd found a hint in Nietzsche. In fact, I don't think I did. <laughs> but the idea was uh, exactly this, that there is, there is a part of us that knows more and a part of us that are wild bright and um, able to do certain important tasks for the part of us that understands the whole picture. Um, thinks it knows everything. Because it knows less, it thinks it knows everything. Mm -hmm. And this, this image, which I think is an accurate one of the way the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere relate to one another, 
is not just a neurological one. It is a neurological one in the sense that I show one can find very clear evidence that it's not just a manner of speaking that the left hemisphere thinks it understands things that it doesn't. If it doesn't understand something, it makes something up and it firmly believes it. It, it thinks it's got it all. It thinks it understands everything. And the very measure of its lack of understanding is its confidence that it does understand. Mm. Whereas the right hemisphere, even when it's right, even when it does know things, tends to be more tentative in the sense that it realizes that there may be more to this than it's able to fully express or understand. Now that image, which as you say, you, you give me an example there from, from Idris Shah, um, is, is everywhere. Um, let me start with a few examples, starting from science and moving more into those areas. Um, an early researcher in hemisphere difference, Stuart Dimond um, uh, from Cardiff, wrote that what he called thought um, in language, linguistic thought thinks it is a prince, he says. I mean, this is a, this is a neuroscientist writing about the relationship between the hemispheres. He think, it thinks it is a prince and can, as it were, dispense with the other faculties in whatever way it, it uh, prefers. And there are some uh, recordings of David Bohm's conversations in California back in the 60s and 70s, in which he talks about thought. And what he means by thought becomes very clear. It means left hemisphere thinking. And he says thought tells you it's not really doing anything. It's your servant. It's just putting things there for you to deal with. But I say to you, says Bohm, it is not just putting things there. It says you are in charge, but it controls you. Its way of thinking, it deceptively tells you, is just another thing that you can take or leave, but it isn't. It controls the way that you are. And he says that one of the challenges uh, is to make that what he calls thought visible to people so that they realize the danger that it represents. So one way of talking about my recent project is that I want to make that kind of thinking, obviously not thinking in itself, which I admire uh, <laughs> inevitably. And indeed, there's a lot of thinking went into those books. And I'm not, let me just make it absolutely clear, I have nothing to say against science or reason, when science is scientific and reason is reasonable, nothing at all. But they're not the answer to everything, they can't control everything. So just to, uh, I, then I will wrap up and, 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 and say less about this, but in the last five to 10 years, I've come across images from Chinese literature, from Indian literature, from the Indian, North American Indian native people's literature, um, all containing myths about there being two powers, two brothers, um, a general and an emperor, two competing powers that should actually be working together, but the one that is inferior and knows less thinks it knows more. And I, I, at the end of the book, I quote from The Secret of the Golden Flower, where it says that, you know, um, the conscious mind, by which I think it means exactly what you were, you were talking about, the commanding intellect. Um, the, the conscious mind is like a a violent general um, that tries to control its fiefdom. And um, it, it, the warning is that unless the sword is turned round, that disaster will ensue. And at the end of the book, I explain what I mean by that disaster ensuing. Mm, you certainly do. And uh, you very kindly allowed us to reprint in the journal the, <laughs> uh, a passage or two explaining your view of um, what's really going wrong with the world at the moment in big time. And uh, I, I think it's something that everybody should stop and think about before it's too late. It may already be too late. There's no guarantees um, no. Going to succeed as a species um, forever. Um, so that, that whole... Oh, 
I mean, can you give some examples of, of why you think the left or how you think the left hemisphere is so damaging? I mean, I can give some, but I'm sure you can give some too. I mean, for example, um, the power of bureaucracy, the power uh, that people have to say no to things when they should be saying yes or just saying, oh, I don't know. But, you know, people like to say no. It's the easiest way of exercising power is to say no. And, and if you've got a bureaucratic system with rules and regulations and tick boxes, um, you somehow don't even take responsibility for saying no because you're hidden behind this veil of bureaucracy. Um, that's one element of, of what's going wrong. The ability to not read context. Um, where has that gone? You know, it's, it, why don't people see the context now that some of the decisions people take, uh, the national decisions as well as personal decisions, are just missing the bigger context always. I, what other, well, how will this affect people uh, it, it personally? You know, if they decide to build a, a thousand houses in the field next to your village, you know, what, 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 how's that going to affect the village, which is the bigger context mm. and so on. Uh, it's uh, it's a bit hard. Uh, it heartbreaking some of the things that are going on at the moment. Well, there are many things that are going on in the world that are heartbreaking at the moment. I, I agree. Um, and, and I hardly need to point to them um, because they're so obvious, the, 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 the destruction of the natural world, but also things that are going on in our society. Um, even threatening the, the, the continuity of a civilization, and all civilizations come to an end. Uh, maybe ours is uh, on the point of coming to an end. But I, when I talk about um, the left hemisphere thinking, I mean, it can sound very glib and it can sound very simplistic, um, which is why in the epilogue, the last part of the book, um, which you're referring to, I, I do take pains to say this is not a summary of this book and it is not a shortcut to finding out what I'm saying because I'm saying something important about the whole way we conceive who we as human beings are, what the world is and how the two relate. So that is my theme, nothing less than a, a, a sort of different philosophy of life and a different philosophy of, yes, of the cosmos. Um, it is it is an ambitious project, but in a way you you can only do your best and fail. But what I want to do is to put something there that will will give people sustenance to to think differently and to in fact embrace ways of thinking that they probably already have. But if you ask me to to point to to things that are going on in our world, I think the the neglect of context is a very important one context cannot be underestimated but once you start analyzing and breaking things down and, and and bureaucracies are particularly good at doing this taking an isolated question and what are we going to do about it without seeing the ramifications both in space and in time uh, going forwards reflecting on the history going backwards thinking of the other ways in which this thing will have ripple effects moving outwards and even understanding any one simple thing at all cannot be done without a context this first struck me forcibly because as you know i began my life um really interested in the philosophy of of art the philosophy of literature and art what is literature and art and how do we approach them that was the subject of my my first book written in my early mid 20s called against criticism after which i i left um the job of teaching english in universities but one of my main concerns was uh, the neglect of context that once you started analyzing and taking things out of context you didn't just slightly misunderstand something you destroyed them completely yeah. and changed their meaning utterly yeah. so that is certainly one thing you point also to the administrative um, cast of mind. I mean, you've got to remember that a good servant is a bad master in this case, that a good servant gets on with the bureaucracy. The reason that the master in my, in the, the image or metaphor that, 
that furnishes the title of the master in his hemisphere. The reason that the master, the right hemisphere, has delegated a certain kind of work and thinking to the left hemisphere is that it's work that has to be done. But if it's done by the right hemisphere, the one that's seeing the whole picture and trying to understand that, it will stop it from seeing it. this has to be kept somewhat at a distance. It has to be done, but it mustn't become the primary way of thinking. But in our world, it has become the primary way of thinking. Yeah. Let me give a homely example of the relationship between the hemispheres, which I think is not in some ways inaccurate. Of course, uh, no part of the brain is actually a computer. I repudiate that image. But the left hemisphere is nearer to a computer than, than say, the right hemisphere is. The right hemisphere understands a situation, but it wants some work done on the details. So it feeds information to the left hemisphere, which, like a computer, takes in that information with some sort of enthusiasm and plentiful misunderstanding, but goes about doing what it's supposed to do, making, you know, um, coming up with algorithms and procedures and answers, and it then spews that data out. Now, that data is not the end of the question. It doesn't furnish us with an understanding. It just gives us data. And then that data has to be taken back into the whole world, as understood by the right hemisphere, seeing things in context and given a meaning. And it's that part of the process from right first to left and then back to right. It's that return to the right that is now missing. So we end up with in the left hemisphere's vision of a world, one which is made up of atomistic pieces, follows certain procedural rules, is thoroughly disembodied, abstract, decontextualized, and actually meaningless. <laughs> all, all the meaning has been shown off in this process. And then this world reports back to us solemnly, it seems like the world is just a meaningless heap of fragments. Well, of course it is, because that's what you've just done to it. <laughs> yeah, I know. And, so, it, and the need for clear meaning and uh, to ha have this need for meaning satisfied, if that's taken away, you get massive anxiety, depression, all sorts of things in society that are affecting people. People become addicted to all sorts of things they shouldn't be addicted to and, uh, and so on. And... Uh, yeah, it's a it's a real problem. Do you think it's possible, Ian, though, to train ourselves to focus attention uh, under our own sort of willpower, train ourselves to attach and detach attention uh, in, in such a way that would further the human race rather than what's happening now, which is almost potentially destroying what culture we have? Do you think that's possible? Well, I think... Well, I think that in a very um, banal, concrete way, it, it is certainly possible to, to do certain exercises that will train one to shift attention from a narrow focus to a broad, what I call active receptivity. That is certainly true. But I don't think that getting everyone to sit in their bedrooms doing that is really going to be the answer to the problem. <laughs> it's, it's, it's something else. It's that there is something very, very badly wrong with the way in which we conceive what a human being is, who we are. Plotinus's great poignant question asked in the third century AD, who, he says, we. But we, who are we? Now, that's a very simple question to ask, an incredibly difficult one to answer. It seems to me that everything depends on how we answer it. And what I want to do in the book is to awaken us to an understanding of what it is we're not seeing. The difficulty about broadening your focus to see more is that if you're not aware already of there being something missing, then you won't know what it is, as it were, <laughs> to have some idea of where you're you have to have some inkling. It may not be a very clear image yet, but some sense that there's something profound that is missing to enable you to make yourself available to it to speak to you. And to begin with, it can only speak to you rather um, uh, indistinctly. But the more that you pay attention to it, that there is a reverberative process of something growing between us and whatever else there is in this cosmos. And it's that dialogue between what we mistakenly think of as 
in here and what we mistakenly think of as out there. It's that dialogue between the, the consciousness of the individual and the consciousness as a whole of the cosmos that causes things to come into being. Mm. And so we need to be able to cultivate this process, first of all, by a kind of active receptivity, by a kind of listening. And so I want actually en passant just to gloss something you said about saying no, because I understood the context in which you meant that. You meant the importance, uh, the obstructive power that people get and the pleasure they perhaps get, or just the safety they get, feeling they haven't risked anything as long as they say no to something. Yeah. It, within a very left hemisphere system, that's right. But in the broader picture, as I know you know, in the spiritual realm, often the power of saying no to something in order that something else much better and bigger may come into being is an important idea. So I just wanted to mention that. No, no, because, I, because I, a lot of I quite agree. And um, information is what restrains wild energy. <laughs> I mean, without that, uh, you, you've got no uh, no hope really. Uh, you you just have a sort of uh, an anarchy of energy. Uh, throughout the cosmos. So it's information that restrains energy. And uh, that's something else I'd like to hear your views on. Well, I mean, perhaps I could just comment there that one of the themes of the second, well, no, sorry, part three of the book um, is, and it's there probably throughout, is the importance of resistance hmm. to creativity. That creativity is something that comes not out of a single uncomplicated simple thrust or drive, but out of the coming together of contraries. Mm -hmm. And, you know, right at the outset of part three of the book, in which I say, so, you know, armed with what we have learned in the first part of this book about what we can trust on our path to finding out more, what can we say about the cosmos? And the first two chapters um, are about the coincidence of opposites. Mm. and the complex and fascinating relationship between the one and the many, between the general and the particular, uh, the unique case. Um, and what, what throughout I suggest is that there needs to be an element of resistance for anything to come into being. And, and, and to cut a very, very long story short, because there is a long chapter, as you know, chapter 25 of the book, which is almost book length on the relationship between matter and consciousness. But I see matter as an element of resistance within consciousness that enables something to persist. Yes. It doesn't necessarily enable something to come into being at all but it enables it to have a degree of persistence. And that degree of persistence is important. So this relationship between a thing and its opposite, what Empedocles called love and strife, um, is in all mythologies, the necessity for um, what in the um, Judaic tradition is called uh, both halakha and agada. Halakha being the sort of rule-bound way of thinking and Agada being the, the sort of unbound way of thinking. And that there needs to be a harmony between these two, that they need to act in as a, as a, as a functional relationship, not one attacking the other or subduing the other completely. Mm. Yes, consciousness. I mean, I, I, I've come to the conclusion over the last 20 years so years that consciousness is about relationships and um, anything that can appreciate a possible relationship um, with something else, not just people, but animals, plants, um, inanimate matter even, uh, has a form of consciousness because something in it is recognizing that, for example, uh, hydrogen and oxygen recognize somehow that they can make water. How, you know, how do they do that? They mu there must be a form of a very, very different and we might say primitive form of consciousness in inanimate matter. But nevertheless, it's there if something new is coming out of the relationship um, between the two elements. Um, and I think consciousness is everywhere. I think you think that as well from, you know, that 
it must be and it must be have something to do with the possibilities of relationships and um our consciousness is a, the type of consciousness we have comes about because our brains it, it's, it's a pattern matching organ it's looking for relationships all the time it's looking for patterns but what is it in i mean joe, joe griffin and i came up with this notion that at the big bang assuming it, it has, everything started with the big bang which most people still think it did um there must have been a subjective um, particle or element that went with every shard of matter, every piece of matter, and, and attached itself to it, with recognizing possible relationships. Um, and we call that, uh, th th those particles or fields, whatever they are, uh, relatons. So, and relatons would form eventually larger and larger relaton fields because everything is a field, really. And from that, um, you would end up with a, a, a universal relaton field, which is everything in the cosmos, you know, all the far distant galaxies and everything, having relationships, because they're all interconnected, as we know now. Uh, nothing exists in isolation anywhere. Even the distant galaxy has gravitational pulls from other galaxies and so on. There's, there are relationships there. So that would make up a huge, huge mind, uh, effectively, which because it contains information, which is what these relatons impart, um, well, it, it would be all wise, all knowing. And this idea of an all knowing God probably came from mystics who intuited this somehow. Um, uh, uh, th that is, uh, that is a, a way we came to think of it. And we wrote about it in, in, um, in, in a book called the, the book called Godhead. Um, so we don't look forward very much to reading. Yes, the bit about consciousness and what happens to consciousness after our death and all that sort of thing is, is a chapter to read definitely in, in there because it explains this idea I've just been trying to express. But again, it's always a problem, isn't it? When you have an insight into something, trying to put it into words, um, for people to pick up on uh, is, is very difficult. But on the other hand, if you don't do that, people mm. don't have something inside them, a pattern inside them, even if it's come from the words or poetry or uh, experiences, you have to have mm. a pattern to attach new knowledge to inside you. Um, you can't just be an empty yes. plate. No, no. Which was... Uh... You covered a, a very great deal of ground there. Um, uh, on that last question, I think I've struggled all my life to express the things that language is not everyday language is not well designed to express. Mm. Um, and it, it, indeed, uh, my first book uh, against criticism, which I mentioned I wrote in my 20s. I struggle very much to explain why the implicit is more important than the explicit, why embodied meaning is better than abstract meaning, and why the unique is every bit as important, if not more important than the general. And, I, and, and in, in some ways, the arguments I needed to marshal were ones that the English language didn't help with. Mm -hmm. And I talked to a, um, a colleague, uh, David Hawkes, a, a very great sinologist, alas, no longer with us. And he said, well, the thing is that all the things you are talking about, all the ideas you are expressing, there are words in Chinese that we simply don't have in English. Um, so at that, that stage, in my late 20s, I thought of training as a sinologist, but <laughs> instead I trained as a doctor. Anyway, um, one of the things, again, just to talk about the need to say something about things about which one knows from the very outset that language will betray one, is why the last substantive chapter before the epilogue, my chapter called The Sense of the Sacred, which again is a, is a short book uh, in length, um, cost me more pains than anything I've ever written in my life, because mm -hmm. I wanted not to do violence to the idea of the sacred. I didn't want to sell it short. 
I didn't want to misrepresent it, but I didn't want to ignore it either. And not to talk about it was to leave a vast hole somewhere that was of ultimate importance. And indeed, the very word God, as I try to explain in the book, um, is itself a problem because it seems by being a single word to be able to pin something down. We, the left hemisphere goes, oh, good, I've got it now. It's yeah. God. Because um, if you think you've got it, you haven't got it. Uh, uh, St. Augustine already said, see, uh, comprehendis non est deus. If you, if, you, if you understand it, it's not God you've understood. And of course, the first words of the Tao Te Ching, uh, the Tao that can be named is not the real Tao. So the more that one says, as it were, the less one can say, and yet one has to say something. So in a way, it is an exercise in apophysis, in, in, in negation, in, in, in arriving at something by chipping away at falsehood. The image I sometimes employ is that of um, Michelangelo producing his David. He didn't begin with an arm or a leg and put them together. He started with a blank block of stone and by constantly discarding and only by discarding, he created something mm. that stood forth that was in the block of stone. So that is the approach to truth that I aim for there. Now you mentioned also, if you'll forgive me for picking it up, um, the idea of consciousness as relationship, and I, I, I warm to that enormously. In fact, entirely coincidentally, I think it's next week, I'm giving a talk to the Essentia, E -S -S -E -N -T -I -A Foundation, uh, of which um, I, I, I'm a board member. Um, and I have only 25 minutes to talk about consciousness so i thought i would confine myself because i don't think you can usually talk about the nature of consciousness in, in 25 minutes unless you confine yourself to something very specific so I find myself to consciousness as relation and we, again 25 minutes is very very short but that is what i want to focus on because we can talk about the nature of consciousness at great length and we can talk about the nature of matter at great length and their relationship one to the other but consciousness is a relationship and that is foundational it is a something that is always tending towards something else or has a an intention towards something that is not just the con not just consciousness itself so it it, it is in essence as something that relates, and I was trying to describe this earlier by saying, you know, in here, out there, these are terms we have to use, but they are in essence ultimately mistaken. But we can't not use them because there is a distinction between my mental world here sitting in this room in 2021 in a particular place in Scotland and the broader consciousness that I encounter in the world. And you mentioned that this might be everywhere. And I think you used inanimate matter. And I would go further and say it's everywhere, full stop, in the, in the cosmos. Yeah. I, I'm glad to report that panpsychism or panexperientialism, effectively the notion that everything has this inward quality of consciousness, of course, the consciousness of some other being will not be like my consciousness, but that it has this element to it is now espoused by mainstream Anglo-American analytic philosophers. For what that's worth, it's been espoused by many other very deep thinking philosophers of many traditions for a long time. But it's nice to know that the mainstream um, tradition uh, that goes on in university faculties in the West um, has now, rather late in the day, said, actually, logically, panpsychism has to be correct because the idea that consciousness can simply emerge is incoherent. It's profoundly incoherent, and I would, I would certainly stand by that. I would go a little bit further. It, it's sticking my neck out, um, but I go this far in the first half a dozen pages of the book as a promise that will be returned to later, and I try to do so, that animacy is not a very, very, very unusual something that happens in this tiny corner of the cosmos. Mm. 
but that animacy is something that asymptotically can be diminished until we have what we call inanimacy. So inanimacy is the limit case of animacy. It's a, it's a case which may be very widespread, um, undoubtedly is, but it's a case in which whatever animacy is has been diminished almost to nothing. Um, but it's not something that incurs uh, somehow, it suddenly appears in the world. In fact, there is, a, I believe, a seamless um, continuity from what we call inanimate to animate, which is another way of saying what I've just said, that there isn't a cutoff point effectively. Um, and that what happens in what we call animacy, the beginning of what we call life, is simply that the processes that go on anyway in inanimate matter, which is constantly changing and forming relationships with things and altering its state, is speeded up by you know, trillion fold. So mm -hmm. things that would have taken billions or trillions of years are able to happen within a very short space of time. So what signifies life is two things. What, what, what distinguishes life is two things. One is a change of pace or rate. And the other is an enormous acceleration of the capacity for responsiveness. Mm. So indeed, as you say, everything in the universe connects with something else and responds to it. But in the case of life, this responsiveness, again, is, is turned up accelerated enormously. And why? Well, I believe because the conscious cosmos requires something that can respond to it and help it grow and come into a fuller understanding of its own being. So that the process of the unfolding of the cosmos is one in which whatever that primordial thing is, you can call it God, you can call it Li, you can call it Rta, you can call it Allah, you can call it the Logos, what you can call it whatever, but the Tao. But whatever that thing is that, that gives shape, form, meaning, beauty, and complexity to the cosmos, because from the word go, it has shape, form, and beauty and complexity. It, those things come further and further into being and require recognition. And the living is the one that recognizes. The living is the one that can value. It doesn't invent value. I have a chapter on value in the third part of the book. And it may surprise people that along with chapters on space and time and matter and consciousness and movement and so on, that there's one on value. Surely values are just judgments we make about things that are convenient for us or not convenient for us. Well, I argue very strongly against that, and I'm not by any means alone in that. Again, there are philosophers within the mainstream of modern Anglo-American analytic philosophy who would agree with me that values such as beauty, goodness, and truth are not reducible to other things. They're not just colors that are painted on the world. They are what are called ontological primitives, i.e. they are as basic as anything can be, what we agree to apply them to changes with time, with place, with culture, from person to person, and so on. But the existence of them is not brought about by us. It is responded to by us, grown by us, and brought further and further into being by us. Mm. Gosh, that's, uh, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I mean, that's the wonderful thing about reading your book all the time, all these sparks of recognition and and knowing something is true is uh just despite what other people might say you know if certain authorities might say that's not true that's not true but if something is true it's true that's the only way of measuring something and i think uh, what what you've written in this book is has that quality about it as being true and i just hope lots and lots of um people read it and, and, and reflect on it. There isn't in our speeded up world though, much time for people to read books like this. It, I mean, it, it took me yeah. a long time to read it and uh, yeah. people are so yeah. easily distracted now. It's, it's gonna be hard for people to really get into what you're trying to say. But you, one of the things you say somewhere is that um, <clears throat> there's an evolutionary purpose for the two sides of the, the brain to evolve the way they have. And the obvious 
immediate purpose is for survival in terms of like, you know, a bird has to be able to recognize a seed on the ground, but at the same time be alert to the bigger context. You know, is, is there a sparrow hawk lurking about that I've got to avoid and that, that sort of thing. And, um, and that, that's one element of it, but the bigger picture must be um, something to do with um, the evolutionary purpose, you know, what, what purpose beyond mere, not mere survival, survival is very important, but beyond survival, do you think that these two hemispheres, which exist in creatures going back millions and millions of years, that this uh, um, asymmetrical division of, of the brain, or forerunners of the brain, I mean, what do you think the evolutionary purpose is? Um, well, you've referred partly to it. Um, and I will come back to that. But I just wanted to, if I may, just pick up very quickly what you said about the long, the long book. Um, it is a long book. And one of the things that I can't convey in, in this talk, if I say things that may sound rather um, unusual or unsupported, is that one of the reasons it's a very long book is that I am painstaking to produce argument. I don't just assert things and say, well, that's true as far as I know. I mean, the whole reason it is so very, very um, weighty is that I adduce evidence from neurology and from physics to support points of view that are argued for philosophically at some length. So, and, and my my hope is um, that, that it's quite true that we live in a culture in which the, the brief is, is privileged over the longer. But that very fact um, means that there is a hunger among people for something substantial. And I, I, you would be quite surprised at the number of people who have written to me over the years saying, I have written, I'm reading your book for the third time. For some reason, it's often the third time at which people write to me. But the very fact that anyone would read it for three times is to me striking because it was already a longish book. And one person, an academic wrote to me, and I won't mention who it is, but he wrote and said, I'm reading your book for the third time. I've got to about page 300 and something, and I've already taken 990 notes. And I, I, I think, you know, <laughs> so what I'm really saying is I think there is room for a long book. And I say at the beginning of the book, you don't have to read it all in one sitting. You can read parts of it and come back to it. And I want it to be not a stress to read it. I don't want it to be another pressure to be fitted into a busy life. I understand how short of time we are. But on the other hand, I want this to be a companionable journey in which people can dip in and come back, dip in and come back. And, you know, in the 19th century, there were many, many, all the really great philosophy of the 19th century was in books very, very much longer than The Matter With Things. <laughs> But to come to your immediate question, I thought it worth saying that because I don't want people to feel defeated by the length of this book. I don't want people no, to go, oh, God, I, I, didn't I, give I, 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 I can't cope with that. No. Finally, yes, sorry, to come to your, your point about why do I think this is the case? Why do I think that there are these asymmetries? And why do I think, what do I think they're evolutionary? Um, Purpose. Advantage. Uh, yeah. You said purpose. Um, purpose. Okay. Um, well, um, first of all, as you know, the most ancient creature that we know of that has anything claiming to be a neural network already has an asymmetrical one, known as the Silovic Tensis, a 700 million year old sea anemone. Um, so it's absolutely fundamental and there is no question that all living creatures that we look at have um, asymmetrical nervous systems. The simple answer, I believe, and I don't know of a better one, is that we need to solve the problem of paying two kinds of attention to the world simultaneously, one being to precisely targeted details that we want to manipulate to get food, to build shelter, to make a tool, to do whatever it is we need to do in order to 
um, answer an immediate demand of survival. And at the same time, which is impossible, pay the exact opposite kind of attention, broad, open, vigilant, sustained, and completely without any preconception as to what we may find. So these are opposites. And since attention is nothing less than the way we dispose consciousness towards the world, that's what attention means. How am I disposing my consciousness towards the world? Mm. If you have to do it twice at the same time, you need two neural masses, neuronal masses that are capable of doing so. That is the, the simple practical answer to that. I think, though, that in the long run, taking a much, much bigger view of where this leads. I think we need both of these ways of thinking in order fully to understand the world at all. And not, not just from an everyday point of view, but if we're really to not just be able to use it, not just to have information about it, a word I might want to return to because it's one you've used several times, a word I think is problematic. Um, information, not just to have even knowledge, but to have understanding. We need both of these ways of approaching the world uh, to be present, but we need them to be in a hierarchy, always in a hierarchy in which the broad open one takes into account the narrow, highly focused one, the right hemisphere, the master, having the proper relationship to the emissary, not the emissary trying to depose the master. And this is the problem of our culture and of many cultures as, you know, if it was true in the 8th century in China, uh, if it was true in, um, in timeless Iroquois legends, it's true over time, not just now. So we need both of these kinds of attention. And again, I come back to uh, the wonderful um, Kabbalic tradition about which I knew next to nothing until about six or seven years ago. Uh, the Kabbalah, incredibly rich because time and again it has insights that exactly reflect what I'm trying to convey about the structure of the brain. And all I can say is that people have reflected on inwardly the structure of mind and brain attentively, and they've come up with structures that are very like this. And in the Kabbalah, one of the many, many rich images that I could come up with is that it is said that what exists is like a tree that has two sides, the right and left. And one is associated with a principle called Chochmah, and one is associated with a principle called Bina. And these are called like two brothers or two sisters that need to coexist. And Chochmah is effectively the right hemisphere, and Bina is effectively the left hemisphere. And again, like Haggadah and, uh, uh, Hag Agadah and Halakha, they need both to coexist, but ultimately they need to be unified. The spirit of union and the spirit of disunion or division need themselves to be unified not divided. So at a meta level, union trumps division. Union, the principle of the right hemisphere, trumps division, the principle of the left hemisphere. But nonetheless, the principle of the left hemisphere is essential. It must be there. It is like the grit in the oyster. It is like the element of resistance that, that enables something to come about. So it, it, it both has to have been there, but have to be transcended. And again, a homely instance I use, forgive me if you've heard this before, is that of coming to terms with a piece of music and wanting to play it. Initially, you're attracted to it as a whole. Then you realize that if you're to perform it, you need to take it apart and practice difficult passages. And you need to see the, the overall harmonic structure. But when you go on stage to perform it, finally, you must forget all of that. Every bit of it must be forgotten. But that doesn't mean you wasted time doing it. You had to do that. Otherwise, you couldn't give the final performance. It's just that at that point, it is uh, sublimated or better uh, uplifted or aufgehoben, as the German says, into this whole. Mm. Yes, I, no, that's, I think that's a brilliant metaphor. I know you use it quite a lot, but it, it explains exactly, or it, 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 it speaks to people. People know it's true. It's one of those things that um, people can recognize. And um, 
So we talked a bit about conscious. You said there's something about information that you um, wanted to talk about and said that you disagreed slightly with the way I was using the word information. Well, no, I don't necessarily disagree with the way you were using it because I don't know how you were exactly intending it. But, um, but there is a trouble with it in the modern world because of information processing, which oh, is yes. something a com yes. oh, that's computer different. does. Yeah. And it, it can sound like simply data. Yeah. In fact, that's what most people think information is. I have certain information that Paris is the capital of France and, and so forth. And I can use that information that, that, uh, uh, or that, you know, the computer I bought is so many centimeters by so many centimeters. Or this is information. It is not in itself interesting. And I have a hierarchy that information is important, but not in itself interesting or informative. Yes. And what is increasingly informative is when that information is turned into knowledge. So something that would help me understand something. And that understanding comes about. And understanding is a mysterious thing. It's something we can't really define, but it's the level at which it's no longer blind information. and It's no longer just knowledge. It's an experience of something that enables us to come closer to its truth. Now that, 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 that understanding, is is essential to the process and therefore i'm always worried when people talk about the cosmos containing information i think the cosmos contains understanding but it could also be said to contain information if you understand what the word itself means it means in form asian it is the taking of whatever up into a form and that form is what you were speaking about and what physicists speak about as the ultimately irreducible element. Quantum field theory, which is, I think, uh, and uh, of course there are disputes between physicists, but I think it's very widely acknowledged to be probably the best um, fit that we have as a, 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 a theory of the cosmos and the, the nature of matter and consciousness in physics, quantum field theory suggests that there are effectively fields that interrelate with one another. They have enough distinctness to be able to speak of a separate field, but they're not ultimately completely distinct from one another. And they can change their form so that at a certain moment, a certain aspect of that field can be manifest in which we call it a particle. It becomes somehow particulate for a while. Um, so the, the, if you are talking about information in a very, very different way from the way in which the word is normally used in everyday speech, then that's fine. But the trouble is that because it's used in a very degraded way all the time, it, it's a problem for me. Yeah, no, I, I, it is a problem for the whole world, really, because that's, it's, I mean, you could say Logos, for example, is information. That, 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 that's one way of looking at it is, it's which you just described about how forms come about because of the tao, the um, the logos, or whatever, and um, that creates the cosmos that we know. But information and energy, at one level, can cancel each other out, and you get a nothing state. You talked about nothingness in your in your book as well. Um, but that is so unstable, it explodes. I mean, uh, the idea that Joe Griffith and I came up with was that the whole universe is oscillating from a state of energy to a state of um, nothingness, which contains all information, which is unstable, so it explodes out again. So we're actually living through a constant big bang. There is, um, and it's in an eternal moment. It's not in a, in a sort of linear time linear time comes out of that eternal moment and um, that was the kind of way I was trying to talk about information because inf information about how things fit together and, the re and relationships and so on um, when it meets raw energy or it becomes raw energy um, it, 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 you get this explosion of you know that, so the big bang is a continual um, 
experience of, of, of the cosmos. It's happening all the time. Um, again, that, that was something mm. that came about through reading a lot of poetry and uh, mystical writings and so on. And, and, and they are very explicit about this process. Um, yes, yeah. I, I like all, all of that a lot. Um, the, uh, it's not just poets and, and mystics too. I, I think, um, well, I do quote in the book, but I think it's from Schrodinger where he says the only thing that is eternal is the present, is yes. now. Yes, um, right. and um, but what and what you are talking about? I like this first of all because well, uh, several things about what you said um, immediately struck a chord with me. One was the idea that c creation is an eternal process. This is not something that that happened or or simply you know. It, 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 there was a, a process and, and we're now no longer in that process. Um, the creation, whatever that is, we are in a constantly creative cosmos that, that never endingly creates. So that's one point, which, which actually is in keeping both with physics and with um, a philosophical position uh, espoused by ancient um, traditions of wisdom. But also what I like is the idea of oscillation, because it seems that, uh, again, physicists would agree with this, that things are in a state of constant uh, oscillation, that nothing is in a, first of all, stasis. The Newtonian perfect state doesn't exist at all. It's only asymptotically approached by things that have less and less motion. And that motion is always reverberative. And reverberative motion is oscillation. And that image is a very strong one for understanding all the aspects of my argument throughout the book. Yeah. Um, but also another way of thinking about these things coming and going from existence would be what I call potential, a field of potential that is infinite, that is constantly precipitating out of itself the actual. And the actual is what we privilege over the potential. But that is just the, just the thing we do. We privilege the actual over the potential. But we might just as well privilege the potential over the actual. Mm -hmm. There's very much more to the potential than there is to the actual, as there is to the field than there is to the particle in which it manifests itself. Mm. Yes, I mean, I, I, it's, it is an astonishment to me, and became so more and more as I grew older, of how much, uh, how these mystical writers, are, well, they weren't just writers, they, just, they lived, and, and some of them produced poetry, um, uh, I mean, I've got some here. I'm just going to read a couple of lines from Yami, who says, um, this universe is changed and renewed unceasingly at every moment and at every breath. Every instant, one universe is annihilated and another resembling it is taking its place. And the majority of men do not perceive this. I mean, that, that was, um, oh, I haven't got the date, but that's uh, hundreds of years ago that was written. And Ibn Arabi and Ghazali and Rumi wrote similar, well, the, the same idea, but trying to express it in poetry and, and words, which is difficult to do, but at least those words put the idea in your head and in people's heads that actually supposing this is true. And of course, physicists have had uh, a same, same sort of half the last hundred years been saying similar things, which is, you know, this is a participatory universe and so on. This all that all comes from physics, but it's it's also part of these mystical traditions from all sorts of different cultures. Yes, um, and and you, you you're referring there to to John Archibald Wheeler's uh, simple but I think pregnant remark that it is a participatory universe, which uh, I, yeah. I like very much. And I I hate ever to have a reason to disagree with you, especially when you back yourself up with um, great mystics. But y y y you may be aware that actually I do take issue with this very idea that the universe ceases to be and keeps coming into being. Be because this is, the, this is the sliced idea of the universe, yeah. that it's constantly, going, constantly being sliced. 
and a new slice happens, but so infinitesimally thin is the slice and so infinitely fast is the replacement that you don't, you're not aware of it. And I, I'm, I'm concerned about this because um, of my neuropsychological background, because the left hemisphere accounts for con continuity by precisely this subterfuge that a non-extended moment or a non-extended point is juxtaposed with many others in order to create either duration in time or extension in space. And yet, as has been often pointed out, you cannot get from a moment which has no duration, even if you put a billion, billion, trillion, an infinite number of them together, there will still be no duration. And you cannot do that with a point in a line. Once you have a line, you can retrospectively find in your mental representation of that line a point, but you cannot make a point going forward by adding another point to another point because a point has no extension and an infinite number of things that have no extension has no extension. This is something I argue at length and therefore I am reluctant to embrace that particular idea. And the reason... And, and, there are two reasons why I two reasons why I particularly am reluctant to um, distance myself from that's why I'm keen to distance myself from it. One is that Descartes makes this point, and Descartes has an extremely left hemisphere view of uh, he, he says that the only way that he can continue existing is that he's constantly recreated every every um, billionth of a second. And and the other thing is that it leads to the multiverses hypothesis that always the universe is going out of existence and another one is being brought in and that every time you act or anytime anything happens at all the universe bifurcates and as you know i i show that this is actually a very typical left hemisphere way of trying oh, to yes. get around problems that it can't account for yes i mean we came up with that idea um partly from reading barber's um, idea but then adding what happens is uh, in physics, from my amateur reading of, of uh, physics, is that every particle um, disappears and reappears to the next possibility. And that was what we were trying to get across. If, and if every particle in the universe is um, disappearing and reappearing to the next possibility, that would explain, that is an oscillation. And that, uh, and, and it was, all we did was sort of say, well, if that's happening at a, at a particle, particle level or field, tiny field level, because particles are little fields really, um, we, we've got um, the whole universe doing that. That's, so the universe is sort of pulsating, oscillating on and off, but in uh, what you're saying is absolutely right uh, to criticize that idea, except if you're in, doing that in an eternal moment, um, you're not slicing up the universe, it's an eternal moment um situation yeah. um where yeah. the where the, this oscillation is happening but um yes but, but, well the first thing to say is to agree with you uh, or, or to, uh, to to be with you in saying that of course i'm not a uh, by any means a, 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 a physicist i i'm i'm a total amateur Fortunately, I have um, a group of, of, of a number of physicists who corresponded with me because they found the ideas in the master and his emissary resonated. And so before I've published anything that, where I quote physics, I've run, them, run it past physicists who said, um, no, you're not misunderstanding this. So th that, that is, of course, physicists are, um, are factional and as, as all scientists are, and therefore there will be some who say nonsense to, to what one, sci one scientist says is good and another will say is bad. But, but in any case, I, I'm not holding myself up as, uh, uh, as any kind of uh, remote authority on these things. But um, I, I think what you did there was rather good, which was to bring together the idea of continuity and discontinuity in a kind of continuum. <laughs> in other words, bringing together union and division into a kind of union, that ultimately these opposites are unified. And I, I think that that actually is, perhaps I could just say something about an idea of, of the divine, which I, I put forward in, in my work here is I think there's an enormous body of evidence that suggests that in practically all traditions, people have seen God, those who've written about the experience of God, those who've written uh, uh, trying to understand the nature of God, 
have spoken not of a thing that is completed, perfect, finished. Uh, and perfectus in Latin means finished. Um, gone through to the end and now that's it. But is in fact in process. And I know that not all theologians are happy with process theology. I had a very, I was privileged to have a, a very interesting uh, conversation with Rowan Williams virtually in Cambridge in the last year, uh, which unfortunately was not recorded, um, in which we very largely agreed about many things. But the one thing that he, we didn't agree on was he said, I'm, I'm, I'm only a modest fan of uh, process theology, which I perfectly understand. But one thing that I think I could say is that it is possible to have two kinds of truth when it comes to something as difficult to grasp as the divine. And one may be, as it were, the God that is timeless, eternal and single. But the other aspect is this continuously developing, coming into being creative element. And that these two are not necessarily ultimately in conflict. That's all I would say about that. So your remark about that was, was lovely. Mm. Can I tell the, the, the little story, I think I've told you it, of, of Rabbi Sachs's. I, I like it so much. Yeah. Because, because one, of the <laughs> well, one of the things I argue in this book is that we need not either both and or either or but both both and and either or and this is beautifully imaged in a, a, an amusing story that i heard um, jonathan sachs tell on the radio and it was about a pious man who was reading the talmud and he found that rabbi x had said that a certain thing was absolutely the case and on re reading further he found that another rabbi said that it was absolutely not the case and so he was confused and he did what any pious man would do he put his confusion before god and he prayed which one of them is right and the answer came back both of them are right to which the man with some degree of exasperation said but what do you mean they can't both be right to which God replied, all three of you are right. <laughs> <laughs> I know. There's a version of that joke as a Malanesadin story as well. Which is, is it? Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll send it to you if I'm kind of, It's the same pattern. You often find truths in stories and poetry yes. and, and jokes and so on, repeating in different cultures. And that, that absolutely. is an example of that. Well, you'd expect that. After all, if, the, if there's some central truth being yeah. got at, you'd expect yeah. it to be constantly rediscovered. Yeah. What I particularly like about the journey that I went on in this book is that I suppose I relied on three main um, disciplines. One is neurology. Another is philosophy. And the third is physics, as I say, very much uh, as, a, as a, uh, a confirmatory rather than a foundational one. Um, but what you might think is they all begin from different places. And so around the surface of the sphere, they're quite far apart from one another. But the more you pursued the paths of these three things, you came down to the same vision, the same core truths, which to me is itself an indication that one might well be onto something. And if those core truths are also those quite independently discovered by ancient traditions, ones that I didn't even know about until I was well, well advanced in my yeah. um, writing and conceiving of my work, then that also is very pleasing. Yes, it is. Well, the, the wonderful Red Indian story, you're not, you're not allowed to call them Red Indians, but the, the, the Red Indian story that you start one section with, it's absolutely oh yes totally an, an onondaga legend yes that's yeah. right yes a completely amazing story i mean one of the most profound stories i i and i felt i had to start part three with it because it it it, it, it touched on so many things that i wanted to say and so many um traditions in in tales from around the world feature two brothers where one goes off and does one thing and the other goes off and does another and and they re represent the two sides of the brain really you know in the like the um the magic horse i don't know if you know that story but right, right. um yes too long for me to quickly tell now but that's one story like that 
And there's an ancient story from Egypt about two brothers as well. Um, a friend of um, Blake's, uh, oh. and what is, what is interesting to me about it is that the angels going up the spiral ladder, uh, most of them are, are accompanying children, which of course are possibilities. And they go up yeah. into the Godhead, which I would say is a nothing state that contains all um, information and then come down again. And as, when they come down, some of them are ca carrying measurement instruments and um, wine and, and food and, and things like that and, and books. And th that, that sort of, again, reflects the whole idea that one part is about the, the arc of ascent, as it were, is the arc of um, getting up to um, a state of wholeness and and then coming back down with uh, with all these things, some of which do great damage to the world, you know, like the excessive obsession that you're talking about with to data and measurement. Um, so, but it was very nice for to send me that. Um, which Blake also was very concerned about, of course. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But it is yeah. it is a wonderfully rich image, and uh, yes, thank you for pointing out that that. The, the angels are often accompanied by children representing possibility. I, I like that. And, and also the fact, of course, it is a dream. And so the dreamer, dream, when you dream, as you know, uh, you get a little REM activity, which is the orientation response going off to uh, what you've been thinking about. This is why sometimes when you wake up from a dream, you understand something that you didn't understand the night before you went to bed. And Absolutely. I, I think that that REM state I had a near-death experience and I went into um, a, a strange state. Um, I nearly died several times one night in hospital and it's quite a common thing. Um, but I knew because I'd been thinking about the REM state, that came to mind and I knew I was in it. And I, th I think, and when you, you look at people who are in trance in mystical trances and so on, they, you see rapid eye movements. So the orientation response is seeing something and it's Very interesting. And, and it seems as if knowledge can come into the world that way from some state mm. outside of ourselves. And one of the best examples of that, I think, is Jakob Baum's um, description of his first major mystical experience. I'm, I'm sure yeah. you know it. And he was walking across a field and his mind was empty, really. And then suddenly all this information about how the universe worked <laughs> flooding into him. And I'm sure that's true. I'm sure that happens. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I think that's how a lot of these mystics, you know, that if they can empty the, their minds to some degree of everyday concerns and, and so on, sometimes that happens to them. And that's why they suddenly know so much, um, uh, you know, without all, but, they have to put in no, everything I mean, somewhere but first, but. Um, oh, well, absolutely. Well, uh, uh, and as you know, I write a lot about the process of, creativity in science and maths as much as in the arts and and how much of it uh, almost all of it comes of course not without um, serial effort often over years but actually the discoveries are not made by serial effort the discoveries are made by the sudden perception yeah. of a pattern and intuition that comes um, almost invariably uh, in, a, in an instant and is a different sort of process and it's very robustly associated with activity in the right superior temporal sulcus and the right amygdala. But I'd be interested to know, but this may be, of course, feel free to say no, uh, but you might or might not want to tell us more about what happened when you had near-death experiences. I'd be fascinated to know. Um, well, I wrote about it in my memoirs, but when you write something, down, <laughs> as you know, the, the magic can disappear. But um, I, I, I had a perforated metal diverticulum, so basically my stomach exploded and, and I was rushed off to hospital. And, um, and they, to keep my stomach empty, they put down a thing down in, into my stomach, a tube. Um, but... I had a lot of phlegm in my throat and I couldn't breathe. So I kept passing right. out and effectively dying, but I couldn't draw anyone's, I couldn't speak, I couldn't breathe. And I, I felt myself going off into the, this state. And that happened, I don't know, three or four times that night. And, I, and then I went into this strange state. Um, 
where I was met by somebody who started to show me around um, a world that was similar to ours, but not exactly the same. And they were pointing out that it's not exactly the same. And it was a very pleasant experience and it was very beautiful. One odd thing that happened in this near-death experience was that um, I, I, came, I was shown or came across a, a kind of library of metaphors that was consisted of drawers, columns of drawers rising up into the sky, almost you know to infinity. And each drawer had a word on it. And, and somehow I opened the drawers, wherever, whichever drawer I opened, inside were all the metaphorical associations with that word, which were just incredible and very poetic. And, and the person was not somebody that you recognised? Well, it was a sort of a, a guide type person, who, right. a wise person, if you like. Right, gosh. Very interesting. I, I, I you know, I just... I don't know what to make of these things, but I love to hear about them because I think one one needs to well, amass well, as much. Well, obviously, I, it hadn't, to me, hadn't happened to me before, so I started reading up about it. And most, but not all, people who've experienced those kind of things died and come back to life and so on. And there's a lot of them. There's happened, you know. There's it's quite common. Oh, I know. Um, a vast, they all say you know. most of them say that they're not afraid to die anymore, and and I'm and it's true. Yeah. I'm not afraid. I don't want to die painfully or or in a or on a hospital bed yeah. particularly. But my fear yeah. of death yeah. has disappeared. It's the most peculiar. Yes, now, that is an interesting feature, and I think that there are a small group of people. I think it's not more than three or four percent who do have a, a quite unpleasant experience in the mm. near death experience. But the absolutely overwhelming majority have something rather similar to what you're describing. Yes. Of course, the details vary, but um, and there are all sorts of theories about why that might be. And I, I'm agnostic about that. I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't say it's this or it's that. It could be, or it might be other things we don't know. Well, one, one of one of the things. Sorry, yes. one of the things that I, I've realized is that if you're um, coming from one religious tradition or a diff another different, you, ha you have visions that are associated with what you've, you're preoccupied with. So um, if you're preoccupied um, with uh, religious duty, you, you might, that religion might be reflected in your experience. If you're interested in science or discovering something, that might come into it. Um, I mean, I, I was one, interested in how wonderful nature is and, and, and uh, you know, still always trying to recapture that feeling I had as a small child that Wordsworth talks about in his poetry, yeah. poetry that you quote a lot. Um, that, that, uh, and the, the discovery for me that the REM state was involved in a lot of these mm. inner experiences because it's kind of an orientation response, as you know. Yes, yeah. People who don't know, well, it's, obviously... it's the rapid eye movement state that you can see. And um... Yes. Well, well, I mean, uh, you're right, and obviously you would expect that um, your tradition you come from and what preoccupations you have will 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 colour what it is that you experience. But I quote also in in the book, um, research done on so-called um, God experiences. Uh, and there are an enormous number of these. And I think that the particular piece of research I quote uh, or cite um, concerns something like 2,200 cases, something in that order. And they, uh, a lot of these people had no uh, prior religious beliefs, but afterwards, um, uh, not all, but again, the majority did. It changed very much their view of the world, their view of death, and so on. And um, some of these were experiences after taking drugs, and some of them were not. And it didn't really seem to matter very much whether they were experiences after taking drugs or just, um, as it were, uh, in, in a drug-naive individual. Mm -hmm. um, the same patterns were followed, that the experience was profound, uplifting, 
um, changed the way people thought about the world for, you know, for the good, and in many cases increased uh, belief in, in the existence of a God. Mm. Uh, yeah. What you make of that, of course, is yeah. up to you, and I, I, I don't push a point of view. Wow. I, I'm interested in investigating the evidence and trying to make sense of it in the best possible way. Yes, the, the, the phrase of God is, God is not a thing, as you might say in your book, I don't know. Um, uh, Absolutely it, not a thing, no. One talks about, about uh, a God as if, or any God, or God, as if it's a, a person or a thing, but um, it can't be like that, obviously. It, it can't be like that, and yet we have no alternative because just yeah, thinking of it as an inert object doesn't work either. So it's a something relational, and what we know by relational is 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 people. We have the the most vivid images that we have of whatever we mean by the profoundly meaningful, the relational, the emotional, the spiritual, and the physical is a person. So it's not surprising that. In various traditions, persons, gods, different gods, or a single god is image. The difficulty is that once you've got that image, you then have to go, and yet that image is also wrong <laughs> because it's an image. And that's why in many traditions, having a name of God or, you know, it's a name that must not be spoken, or yeah. the image of God must never be portrayed because it is itself a blasphemous idol and so forth. So th th this is why these traditions run into into those problems but what i don't think is good enough is just to say oh well in that case it's fairly obvious that all these you know people with their insights their their, their, their poetic insights their philosophical insights were just mistaken no i think you have to give it time of day and say not everything can be encompassable by science that's not to disrespect science it's just to set proper limits not everything is encompassable by reason that's not to disrespect reason, it's just to set proper limits. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I like to take a very great piece of music, such as Mozart's G minor quintet, or, or, or even better, Schubert's C major quintet. I mean, the, these are utterly profound things that are by no means meaningless, but they're also not, not irrational. And science can't explain them. I mean, science can, yes, tell me what neurons are twangling when I'm listening to it, but that in itself does not explain <laughs> the existence of the music or, or the experience I'm having. Yeah. So uh, all I'm really saying is that one has to be open-minded and not dogmatic about these things and try and understand something that so many people have thought was so important because yeah. I suspect they're onto something and it's really our job to find out what that is, not just to go, well, that's all nonsense, obviously. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> I, I've just realized just this moment, you know, in Islam, they have this um, prohibition of, uh, a lot of them do about showing figures in some parts of the Islamic okay. tradition. Absolutely. Absolutely. use patterns, but you can't paint a person. And, and of course, right. that comes back to the idea that uh, some of the, the saints have said, I am God. And of course, we are, in a sense, we're part of everything and we're connected to everything else. Um, I, I wonder if that's why that tradition grew up, that you shouldn't actually try and paint um, figures because the figures are also God. But anyway, that's just an aside. Well, it, it could be. I mean, my way of understanding it, perhaps a bit simple, is that um, there is a profound insight that a representation is not the same as the thing that is represented. That actually is essentially the difference between the right hemisphere, which has an experience of something as it presences, to use a Heideggerian term, and the left hemisphere, which has only a representation, which literally means something that is present after the fact, when it actually is no longer present. And yeah. that difference between the representation and the presence lies behind so many problems in our world, in which our representation of the world trumps our experience of it as it presences. The map triumphs over the world that is mapped. The theory, time and again, gosh, if you just listen to the news and listen to the things people say, every time I hear these things, I think 
somebody's theory about how things ought to be according to them just completely trumps any reality of how things actually are. And this, this is the problem. So to have a prohibition on a representation of something so important as, say, the divine makes sense to me. Mm. And, and you know that in Christianity, I, of course, we associate this prohibition with Islam, but in Christianity, it was three centuries before there was a representation of Christ crucified. Mm. It's on the doors of Santa Sabina, I think, on the Aventine Hill in Rome. But it's, it's remarkable because it was, as it were, not, not as it were possible for hundreds of years. Mm. No, I didn't know that. That's... Uh... Gosh, I mean, this whole thing about present presence and representation has been made a thousand times worse for people by these mobile phones. So they're taking photographs of things all the time instead of looking at the things. And, you know, they even take photographs of their meals and, the, and uh, just photographs, photographs. And yet they're not actually looking at the scenery. <laughs> it's just it's, it's amazing. Millions and millions of photographs are taken every day on these mobile phones. Um, and, and what for? They're trying to represent well, something that's there, but then they stop looking at it. Well, of course, you're right. And, you know, I, I don't want to be holier than thou. I, when I see something beautiful, I, I, I in, increasingly less think I would like a photograph. Although one of the things I did when I was 18 was, was walk uh, for six months in the Middle East. It couldn't possibly be done now. Um, and uh, spent time in Iran and so on. And I took a camera with me for six months. And in those six months, I took six photographs because all the time I was thinking this photograph Can't. or any photograph will never capture what I'm seeing yeah. now. It will just reduce it. So I've never been a great admirer of that. But in the book, um, I, I do quote a man who is a professor, a Spanish professor of anatomy and therefore presumably a fairly intelligent man who has photographed his entire life or started to do in his 30s or 40s. And he photographs every 30 seconds, every damn thing. And uh, he says somewhat ruefully that he doesn't have time to go through the photographs. <laughs> well, yes, but also he'll find, he'll find that he's died without having lived because he spent all his time taking photographs. Yeah. I mean, it, it is a fascinating phenomenon. That's a particularly pathological instance. But you can see this, I mean, I, I, I can't now, uh, track it down but there was I, I saw a brilliant photograph of a boat in the middle of Milford Sound one of the most awe-inspiring places on the earth you know Milford Sound in New Zealand and there. there's a boat with nine people in it and every one of them has got their head down and they're looking at a, a screen it's a magical place isn't it yes yeah. Well, I, last have never been, but oh, I yeah. hope before I die to find time to go. Um, if they'll let you in now. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes. <laughs> what a world, honestly. <laughs> well, well, and also whether I should go. I mean, whether I should accept invitations to go and talk or, or whether I should be puritanical and say, no, um, th these are insoluble moral conundra. I mean... I, 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 like many of people watching this, there's almost nothing I can do now in which I don't feel guilty, whatever it is. Well, you're made to feel guilty, aren't you? That's, that's, that's part of the technique of frightening people, I think. Well, <laughs> yeah, but there's quite a lot to be concerned about as well. Oh, there, is. <laughs> there absolutely is, but um, uh, yeah. they're, they're also racking up the fear in the population. So you've got this floating anxiety everywhere, which is horrible. You know, it's just not... It, it is horrible, counterproductive. And yes, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I, I, I tend to believe that in this world, there are far more cock-ups than there are conspiracies. But, but on the other hand, I do worry about centralization of power um and the increasing power offered to people through technology uh you know the the the, the little trouble that got out of um pandora's box and can never return to it yeah. that gives gives almost limitless power to people who have no commensurate wisdom to go with it and may not have good intentions mm. gosh <laughs> 
That's probably as a, a good a place to stop, isn't it? Ian? But I wish we could carry we could carry on another time, though. Well, I'd be delighted always to to talk to you again, yeah. Ivan. Um, thank you for for making time today and and oh, and for the conversations you. we've had um, in the past. So thank you and make what you 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 wish of it and let me know whatever you want to do with it. <laughs>